with deliberation and purpose to set all the mind and activities of the day aside. Um, I don't know, it, it's, it's just, I can be sitting there working on a sermon or I can be praying and the next thing I know my mind is weeding the garden. You know? Or I have this to do. And there are so many distractions, many of them are not even bad. But today and this morning as we come together, um, we really need to focus our attention on who God is. We need to set aside by purpose and deliberation. You know, Jesus said, uh, pray because the flesh is what? Weak. Yeah. And what it means by weak is that it is weak. The flesh has nothing in itself to latch hold of God. You know that? Because the flesh, what we, the old us, what we were and what's left over, has no inclination for God whatsoever. I mean, you, you think about, like you said, you know, when I'm praying, and I, you know, I mean, it's like, what are the top five things you would want to do in a day? Of those top five, weeding the garden wouldn't be one of them, would it? But even something that is a, a necessary, you know, sweaty kind of operation takes precedent over God. That says a lot, of, that talks about our weakness. And what we need to do is by the grace of God and by the, the aid of the Spirit of God to set those things as, aside and just have our minds by God's Spirit directed wholly in both, both ways unto God. And one of the ways in which God has done that is to give us his word. And so once you just read over and, and meditate um, <clears throat> upon Psalm 2 and you'll see why this is pertinent uh, in our message. So we'll take a few moments, just look through that, pray over it. Um, and it's just amazing, especially the last couple of verses, uh, that what we're admonished to do. And then I will read it, and then we'll pray and begin. <clears throat> Not to preach a sermon to start with, but let's read together. It says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart, cast away their cords from us. You know, so what you see here is, is the uh, raised fist defiance of the world and its powers, the kings, the rulers, and they say, we will have none of this. We will, we will free ourselves. Verse four gives us God's response. He who sits in the heavens, what? It's like, could you imagine you're out walking along and you hear this real tiny sound right in front of you and you look down and here's this little one ant who's, who's gained the capacity to talk. He lifts up one of its legs and says, I am going to kill you. And he starts cussing you out. And, and, and just you know, saying he's going to do all these horrible things to you. What will be your response? Exactly. In other words, you're laughing. Why? Because any moment you can do what? It's over with. So he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he speaks to them in his wrath and terrifying them in his fury. And what does he do? Oh, I, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're going to rule yourself? No, you're not. It says this, as for me, what does God do? I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron <coughs> and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. He sits in the heavens and you say, oh, you don't want me to rule over you? Here's my response. I'm going to set my king, my anointed, as the ruler of everything. And there's nothing you can do to stop me. And then, that being the case, this one will come and he's going to rule with a rod of iron and dashing all rebellion. And then the admonition is this. Now, that being the case, kings, you better be wise. Rulers, be warned. 
This is what he says to them and he says to us. Serve the Lord with what? Fear. Who are you dealing with? And also, not only to serve him with fear, but what? Rejoice with trembling. Almighty kings of the world and rulers, kiss the son. Do homage, lest he be angry and you're, you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. And then it concludes, blessed are all who take refuge in him. You can rebel against him or take refuge in him. To rebel against him is ruin. To take refuge is rest. Let's pray. Father, as our minds and hearts have just briefly looked at this psalm and to see of your sovereign work and rule, just pray, Father, that your hand would be upon us, that you'd work in our hearts and lives, <coughs> that, Lord, we would indeed serve you with fear and rejoice with trembling and with great delight we would kiss the Son. Just press, pray that, Lord, your blessing and guidance would be upon us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. If you will, please stand for a word of prayer and then... Uh... Father in heaven, we now approach your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to give the appropriate weight to every word that proceeds from your mouth. We are prone, Lord, to edit and revise and to reduce. But Lord, you have spoken, and Lord, may we hear. Now, Lord, may you grant me to speak that which is your word, that we might relish in you and in your Son, and that, Lord, you would grant to us all the gift of seeing and the gift of hearing. Just pray this now in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Um, the, uh, we're going to read in two different sections. I want to begin by reading the first section, which is verses 5 through 19. Um, you know, one of the things you're, you're looking at a book like Isaiah, which is very long, a lot of strange names and unfamiliar um, historical episodes and information. And we are prone to say, I don't need that. But God has written it for our good. And we need to pay attention and we'll see. It begins in verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. The staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation, I send him. Against the people of my wrath, I command him. To take spoil and seize plunder and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. But he does not so intend and his heart does not so think. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. For he says, are not my commanders like all kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arphad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? And essentially those are cities that he conquered and it goes from Assyria all the way to the doorstep of Judah. As my hands has reached to the kingdom of idols whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols as I have done to Samaria and her idol images? When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. For he says, this is the king of Assyria, by the strength of my hand I've done it, and by my wisdom, for I have understand, for I have understanding. I remove the boundaries of people and plunder their treasures. Like a bull, I bring down those who sit on thrones. 
My hand has found like a nest the wealth of the peoples, and as one gathers eggs that have been forsaken, so I have gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved a wing or opened the mouth or chirped. Shall the axe boast over him who hews with it? Or the saw magnify himself against him who yields it? As, a, as if a rod should wield him who lifts it, or as if a staff should lift him up who is not wood. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts will send wasting sickness among his stout warriors. And under his glory, a burning will be kindled like the burning of fire. <coughs> the light of Israel will become a fire and his holy one a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. The glory of his forest and of his fruitful land the Lord will destroy both soul and body, and it will be as when a sick man wastes away. The remnant of the trees of the forest will be so few that a child can write them down. God's people said, Amen. What we have here, get kind of set us back in this, this stage, is God speaking, communicating profound truth that we need today in, in real situations and in, in, in contexts, this was a time in which when Isaiah was sent by God to the, the, uh, the tribe or the kingdom of Judah, they were in great straits and deep concern. Um, for some time now, the northern kingdom had constantly on, uh, <coughs> attacked and raided and been a general nuisance to the southern tribe, Judah and Benjamin. And we saw in chapter 7 as King Ahaz, he was fretting because Ephraim had, had made an alliance with Syria and they were going to come down and sump them. And they were distraught. Now, we look at this and, oh, who cares? But essentially, put yourself in a position in which you are in dire strait. In which, in fact, you are terrified for your very existence. And you don't know what you're going to do. So here is Ahaz, the king, and he hears about this um, alliance <coughs> from Ephraim and uh, Syria coming down, going to kick him off the throne. And it, you understand something, if you're kicked off the throne, you're not, you're not sent off into a pasture to enjoy. You're executed or you're ridiculed. So there's a, a great amount of concern and, and, and worry among these people such that God understands this. Now, Ahaz is a wicked king, but God is gracious to me. In fact, he says through Isaiah, you don't need to worry about this, this alliance. They're not going to come and destroy Jerusalem. And in fact, what God says, not only that, but I will, I will allow you to ask for proof that I will be your protector. Just ask. And Ahaz says, no. In fact, what we find is, is that as Ahaz begins to worry about the threat that's to him and his, country, his kingdom, he says, I've got to find help. So I'm going to turn to the most powerful power at that time. I'm going to ultimately turn to Assyria. And so what we find here throughout this first section of the book of Isaiah is essentially these two questions. I will say this repeatedly. Who do you ultimately fear? And who will you ultimately trust? Now here's Ahaz. Truth be known, he far more fears <coughs> Ephraim and the Syrians than he does God. You know that because how he responds, how he acts, how he actually just ignores what God has done in protecting him and refuses the, the, the evidence that God would offer. And instead, he turns to the wicked empire of Assyria <coughs> and looks to them and, in fact, bribes them with vast amounts, tons of gold and silver in order for them to be on his side. And so what we find is chapter 7 through 12 is called the book of Emmanuel. <coughs> And it's important because what ultimately is happening here, kind of like we saw in Psalm 2, is a focus now on God's true Redeemer, 
Emmanuel. Now, what happens, we looked at last time, we had the Lord's table last week before that. We looked at what God did was to destroy the enemy that they feared. What God was doing is demonstrating powerfully and unequivocally that he was in fact the one they should fear. Now what happens in chapter 10, that beginning with verse 5, now God is going to destroy and bring to ruin the very thing they trusted in. Now this is important, not just in a historical context. This is a true principle that what God does is if you do not rest and rely on him, but trust something or someone else in his place, it will be to your ruin and God will ruin that which you trust in. You know, you think about how many people have won the lottery. And what happens? What happens in their lives? And they trusted in the resources. Well, <laughs> what we find today is that God is going <coughs> to destroy the Assyrians, the very people that they trusted in. So we begin, and what happens is this. We are um, we're given what God is doing in the nations. And I'm going to say this at the end, but this is so important. It's kind of like the picture, an argument for the, from the greatest to the less. Um, in the book of Daniel, for example, how did Nebuchadnezzar get on the, on the throne? How was Nebuchadnezzar on the throne? Defeated all countries around Huh? Did he defeat all countries around no, the, the, Ultimately, uh, Daniel says, you have to understand something. God, put ta- God puts up, God takes down. The, the, what, what Isaiah wants us today in 2024 is to realize if God is in absolute charge of the biggest, most powerful nations operating and controlling and indeed manipulating them exactly as he intends. Is he not the same Lord and sovereign of the small details of your life and mine? You know, we live in, in crazy times and it was real crazy yesterday. And you know, we can, we can what in the world's happening? And, and sometimes we become anxious and fretful and worrisome and, and, and then we go, and then we ask the question, what in the world are we going to do, right? Both of those belie the fact that we have a problem because who are we fearing and who are we trusting? And so what God is doing to his people is, to, is in historical context to say, I am in absolute charge and I'm accomplishing exactly what I want to do. Therefore, fear me and trust me. So it begins, here's this most powerful nation, and the Assyrians were dreaded. They weren't not, you know, they they didn't have the Geneva Peace Conference or the Geneva Peace Treaty. That is, when the Assyrians went into a, a country, they deliberately did horrible things. They they actually went for collateral damage. They terrorized people. They were the most feared and frightening adversary because they did atrocities as a, as a daily joy. And God says, listen, to the king of Israel, Ahaz, and to all, don't trust those. So what happens? He says he's going to eliminate the Assyrians. He begins in this and he says, now this is important because what you find here is a contrast between what the king of Assyria thinks and what God knows. On the fir- it begins in verse 5, it says, Woe to the Assyrians, the rod of my anger and the staff of their hand is my fury. What you find here is the ignorance and the arrogance of the king of Assyria. But in reality... All that what the king of Assyria did, does, did, was to carry out what God planned. <clears throat> he says of Assyria, you, Assyria, are the rod of my anger, and the staff in their hand is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him to spoil and seize and plunder and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. 
God's purpose for the Assyrians was to use them as an instrument of judgment. And he says, against who? Against the godless nation, against the people of my fury. Now, who in the world is he talking about? This is referring to the northern uh, ten tribes. Um, if you look at and study the history of the kings of the north and the kings of the south, you find some good kings of the south, right? You find, in varying degrees, Hezekiah, Josiah, Jehoshaphat. You know, you, you, you find some t halfway decent ones, right? You go to the kings of the north. How many good ones are there? And in fact, their whole religious system was in rebellion to God's word. So God says of this northern kingdom, he, he identifies them as a godless nation, as the people of my fury. God raised up Assyria in order to punish the northern kingdom as they deserve to, do, as they deserve to be punished. He's, it says he will um, tread them down like mire of the streets. He will spoil them and seize them. That's God's intention. Now, what does the king of Assyria think? What does, do the tribes, what, the, what are they thinking? What they're thinking is this. Actually, they're plotting, they're thinking that we're going to expand our empire. We're going to expand our country. We're going to be the world's most powerful nation. And he goes on in, in, in verse 8. It says, this is how he's talking. Are not my commanders all kings? And then he lists a bunch of cities that were, uh, that were conquered. How one after another, after another, after another fell. And the king of Assyria goes, look how powerful I am. I'm in charge. I'm doing it. I'm advancing my, my, uh, my empire. I'm crushing all opposition. No one can withstand me. He says in verse 10, as my hand has reached the kingdoms of idols. And, and the idea here is he's going around and, and essentially what people thought was, my, is my God bigger than your God? You know what would determine my God being bigger than your God? If I won. So here's, here's uh, the king, the king of Assyria, perhaps Tiglath-Pleser III. He comes to a country, or a city, and he beats them. Their gods lose, his god wins. Goes to another city, same thing happens, right? My, you know, we win, therefore my, our god is bigger than your god. One after another after another. And he goes, all those are worthless, empty idols. And, and, and the Assyrian king says, but my god is right on. I'm in charge. I've got power. And, he, and, and he, he says this. He's done this to Samaria. And he says, now I'm going to do it to Jerusalem. That was the threat. The picture is, here's the, the Assyrians. They ultimately wipe out the northern kingdom. And here's Judah and Ahaz and the people. And they're shaking in their boots. And the threat of, Ahaz, uh, of Assyria is, I'm going to do the same to you. And your idols aren't going to stop me. It sounds bad and it, it's, it's scary. And, and essentially, you find this absolute arrogance by the part of the king of Assyria. Look at the latter part of verse 12, uh, or the beginning of verse 13. For he says, this is what the king says. <clears throat> he says, by, my, by the strength of my hand I've done it, and by my wisdom, for I, understand, for I have understanding. I remove the boundaries of the people. I plunder their treasures. And like a bull, I bring down those who sit on thrones. My hand is found like a nest, the wealth of the peoples. And the picture is here. If you ever come across a bird's nest, that the bird's long gone, you can take the eggs and you have nobody to stop you. And this is how the king of Assyria says, nobody can touch me. Nobody can stop me. I, have, I, I am just conquering left and right all their gods are of no value i am unstoppable i can do this and no one can stop me that's that's his intention but he's ignorant of something he's ignorant of the fact that he is but a tool in the hand of god that's all he is and it will be demonstrated here in, in prophecy and ultimately we see god is going to decimate and humiliate these people unbelievably bringing them to destruction and ruin. It says, 
the true place of Assyria and its king was but a tool in the hand of God. And when he is done with that tool, he sets it aside. Now, we look at world powers. You know, we we have United States and you have China and you have uh, Russia and you have North Korea and you have all these powers. There's power broken going on, right? You have uh, European Union. And everybody says, what in the world are people going to do, right? Do you realize that all these are but pawns in the hands of Almighty God? And he's sovereign over everything. And the, the implication, and later on we stated, why in the world then do you fear them and why in the world do you trust them? So essentially, when God is done, he's, gonna, he's going to humiliately, in humiliation, judge the Assyrians. And it's interesting. You have essentially three kings, and then the whole Assyrian empire collapses and is replaced by Babylon. And guess what happens to Babylon? It's replaced. And it was replaced by Alexander the Great. And he's replaced. And it's replaced by four of his generals. And it's replaced. And he's replaced by Rome. And it's replaced. And he's replaced. And on and on. America's around. It's going to be replaced. Everything's going to be replaced because these are all temporal. And we have to understand and and get that. And what God is saying to to Ahaz and the people of Judah, you've got to see these things as they really are. I'm going to destroy them. Their arrogance will lead to their utter destruction. He, he, he talks about um, a wasting disease. It, in verse 15, it says, Shall the axe boast over him who hews with it? The picture is this. Here you pick up a tool. And is that tool going to say, What in the world are you doing? You know, I was working in my shop, picked up a chisel. I've never had a t- chisel talk back to me. Why? It can't. Is there any possibility of a tool talking back? And, and, and God says, who in the world do you think you are? You are just a tool in my hand. Now, he's saying this not for the sake of the Assyrians, but for the sake of his people who would put their trust in the Assyrians. That's the strange thing. The strange thing is if, if God is who he is, the creator of the universe, and he did it in six days by just speaking it, Why in the world do we trust anything or anyone other than him? So he's going to humiliate him. It's going to be a wasting disease. It says he is going to undo their glory. As high as 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 he lifted himself up, God is going to smash him down. We talked in Sunday school, remember uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he's walking around looking at the city. He goes, what great city I've made. Look at all the things I've done. And immediately what happens to him? He begins to chew grass like, a, like a, an animal. For seven years, or seven seasons, it's most likely years, he's out of his mind. And God restores him. And finally, he learns a lesson. Who's more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar? Who's more powerful than the king of Assyria? Who's more powerful than everything? God. He's in absolute charge. And again, the question is, if he's in absolute charge, why in the world should you not fear him And should you not trust him? What's interesting is that what God is going to do is he's going to, at the same time he puts down the kingdoms of this earth, he is going to, in his time, exalt the the nation that was judged. Because he has a plan that, that supersedes and transcends ours. And the ultimate end is Assyria will be decimated. Now, right now, you can go to the region around the, uh, the uh, Euphrates and you can find archaeological digs where Nineveh was. <laughs> now, what text did I use? Was. Will you find any remnants of the Assyrian Empire? No. God decimated. God destroyed them. And God is in charge. Now, what happens is a switch. And uh, beginning in verse 20, and I'd like to read this now. So if you go ahead and take your text, we're going to read through this, the second part. What you have is the ruin of the elimination of Assyria. And again, the whole purpose of this is to demonstrate to God's people, why in the world would you trust those who I'm going to destroy? Why would you fear those who I have already destroyed? I will be your fear, I will be your dread, and I will be your trust. Now what God is going to do is saying, now, I'm going to restore you. Verse 20. It says, In that day the remnant of Israel 
And the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean or rely on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of the earth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O oh, my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians. Now what happens is this. He's just talked about the Assyrians as they have decimated the northern kingdom. And, he's, and God says, as, as, as Judah is watching what's going on, they're trusting and resting. And he says, I'm going to wipe them out. And what he's saying, Judah, note and pay attention to history. O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. For in a very little while my fury will come to an end and my anger will be directed to their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will wield against them a whip as when he struck Midian at the rock of Oreb. And his staff will be over the sea and he will lift it up as he did in Egypt. And in that day, his burden will depart from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck and your yoke will be broken because of the fat. <clears throat> the picture is that here, again, you're Judah, you're small, you know, basically almost an insignificant kingdom. Uh, you've been beat on, abused, um, ransacked, constantly been attacked and here is this big powerful uh, nation empire setting its sights on you would you not be scared i mean can you imagine being let's say el, el salvador or some of one of the central uh, 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 south american countries central american countries and all of a sudden the united states goes to war against you with no holes barred how would you feel would you have a chance? Well, here's Judah, and that's how they're feeling. Here's Assyria, ruthless. And God says, you do not need to fear because I'm in charge of everything. In verse 28 and following, he's, he's, he's giving us um, an important picture. Before we get that, he's talking about the remedy. He says in verse 20, it says, in that day. Now, the phrase in that day is referring to the future. It is a term used throughout the Old Testament, especially the latter prophets. Sometimes it's referred to the day of the Lord. And what this is, is right now, is God working? Is God exercising his kingship? But is it obvious? Is he doing it publicly, in a sense? Right? It's not, there is not a public demonstration of the power of God accomplishing his purposes he's always accomplishing his purposes but it doesn't seem to be obvious right when it talks about in that day this is when if you will the god will go public and it will be unmistakable and inescapable what god is doing and everybody will know that the lord is doing it this will be from the sun, you know, rising the sun to the setting of the sun the whole world will be cognizant that the Lord, in fact, is at work. And in fact, he is at, in work publicly for the good of his people. Right now, it looks like in many cases, you know, you look at the Christians in South Korea or North Korea and other places, it doesn't look like the Lord's doing much good for them, does it? I mean, they're suffering persecution, but the day will come where God will go public for the sake and the good of his people. And what Isaiah, by, because God sent him, is to, is to encourage Judah in this time of political turmoil to trust holy and to, holy in God. Notice what will happen in that day. <clears throat> Verse 20, in that day the remnant. Now, the remnant are the people of God who are from the people of God. Uh, well, it seems strange. Um, in Romans 9, it says, 
Um, not all Israel are from Israel. The prophet said it will be like, you know, the, 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 the nation would be as, a, as the sands of the sea, but there will only be a small remnant that, that survive. Jesus kind of like, the, <clears throat> you have the few and the many. You have the vast majority of people are lost. Only a few are saved, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Here you have the vast number of the people of Israel, the vast majority of them, though they had the lineage, though they had the heritage, though they had the, the oracles of God, did not believe in God. But there is a small remnant that God preserves for himself, and they are the ones, and notice what it says, these survivors, the remnant of the house of Jacob, will no longer lean or rely on him who struck them. They're, they're, they're going to they're come to their senses. God's going to bring them to their senses. But they will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. It won't be just something they say. They're going to learn this lesson. They're going to lean, never again lean on the flesh, but they're going to lean wholly unto God. The remnant here, as I said, are described. Now, it's really interesting how he says this. In verse um, 14, let's see, it's 14. No, let's see, you've got to find it here. Uh, verse 21, for though your people Israel, as he is the sands of the sea, only a remnant will return. Destruction and, uh, is decreed, overflowed with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will put an end, a full end, a decreed in the midst of the earth. This is a judgment that he will bring to pass. And what what says here that ultimately they will come to their God. Look at verse 21. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. See that at the end of verse 21? That phrase only occurs two places in the whole of the Old Testament. Here and in Isaiah 9, 6. What does it say? For unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, and the government should be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. What seems to be happening here, and we'll see this especially in chapter 11, is that what God is doing is bringing our trust focused on the king, focused in on Emmanuel, focused in on the service, the, the servant of the Lord. It is not just trusting in general. It is trusting in Christ, who is the mighty God. So, um, <clears throat> though they will be few in number, God will still restore them. And, they, and the result of this this few number was because they, as the whole of the people, will experience the righteous judgment of God. And the sheep and the goats will be separated. Familiar with, uh, was it Matthew 24? You have the sheep and the goats. Those who are and those who are not. Now, what happens is that God is saying this what, why, why in the world is he talking about the future? Because what he's trying to do to the people who are in dire straits and worrisome condition, he says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. Now, if that's reality, and it is, then you can rest. You can be secure. Notice he says, <clears throat> he uses the word therefore. Um, verse 24. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O oh, my people who dwell in Zion, don't be afraid of the Assyrians. I'm going to do this. I'm going to reserve for myself a remnant. I am going to make sure my people are safe. That is your future. I am going to bear my, my sovereign, powerful arm for the sake of my people in the future. That is your guaranteed future. Now, don't be afraid of the Assyrians. Don't, don't fret. Don't worry. Don't stew over them. The future promise must determine the way they were to live in the present. <clears throat> in fact, we'll say this later. There's, basically, you look back on the faithfulness of God and trust what he has done. And you look and bank on the future of the promises that God has made us 
and that's how we live today. And that's what God is trying to tell the, the children of Israel, trying to tell the people, look to what I've done, look to what I've promised, now live accordingly. The Lord will do to them as he did to Egypt. What did God do to Egypt? He says it at least twice in this passage. What did he do to Egypt? Destroyed it. Broke its back. Decimated it. Much, so much so. Have you ever, I was reading in Samuel. It's really interesting. Remember when, the, when the, Fer, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and everything started going bad for them? You know what they started saying? They said, you know, we shouldn't have done this. Why? Because we knew what God did to Egypt. Remember when the, uh, uh, Joshua came to Jericho? What were the people of uh, Jericho saying and fearing? Remember what God had done to Egypt? This, this left a lasting impression upon many of the nations at that time. And God says, look what I did to Egypt. I'm going to do the same thing to Assyria. Why in the world do you worry and fret? Why, and, and more importantly, do you trust them? Why do you rely upon Why do you actually give your monies to a nation who wants your destruction and whom I am going to destroy? It's over with. Don't fear the Assyrians. Talks about how brief it will be. Now what's happening, what's going to happen at this time is essentially after Assyria wipes out the northern kingdom, you see beginning in verse 28 and following, you begin to see God says this is going to be the course of travel from where they're going right to Jerusalem's back door. It says, He hath come to Aath. He has passed from Migron. At Michmash he stores the baggage. They have cr uh, crossed over the pass at Geba. They lodge for night. Rama goes on, makes all these these places and basically it's a route in which the king of Assyria comes as he is going to in his thinking wipe out Jerusalem in fact it says they're going to go there and look in verse 32 this is the uh, uh, this very day he will halt at Nob he will shake his fist at the mount of at the mount of the daughter of Zion the hill of Jerusalem so he will threaten he will say I'm coming I'm going to wipe you out. We're going to see this later in the book of uh, Isaiah where in fact they come, Assyria comes, threatens, but what does God do? Wipes them out. There will be an utter defeat of Assyria. Even though they will come with all their forces against the city of Jerusalem, and wrist and raise their fist and saying, we're going to come and wipe you down. Notice what it says in verse 33. Behold, the Lord, of, Lord God of hosts will lop the bow with, a terri with terrifying po uh, power. And the great in height will be hewn down and the lofty will be brought low. Here's the Assyrians. And like I said, these people had no... Um, control, no restrictions on their power whatsoever. There was no Supreme Court. There were no impeachments. There were nothing. They were absolute authorities. And God says, okay, this is what's going to happen, Judah. They're going to march. I'm going to tell you how they're going to come to your back door. They're going to stop at this place. They're going to say, we're coming. They're going to raise their hand, and then I'm going to decimate them. It's going to be like this huge powerful tree that ultimately is cut down with a chainsaw and falls down and is over with. I am going to utterly wipe them out. It says, he will cut them down. Uh, he will cut down the thickets of the forest with an axe and Lebanon will fall by the, ma by the majestic one. It will be over with and, and God will ruin them all. Now God says this to, the, uh, to Judah and Jerusalem ahead of time. So that when this actually happens and when Assyria starts making this progression toward Jerusalem, what should they feel? What should be their confidence? What did God say is going to happen? And when, when they raise their, their fist and mock and ridicule Jerusalem, should they be fearful? 
Should they be distraught and anxious? Absolutely not. Why? Because God says, this is what I'm going to do. This is where they're going to stop, and this is what I'm going to do to them. That at the very time in which they think they're the most untouchable, I'm going to lop them off and they're going to fall down, and you're going to know that I, the Lord, reigns and rules. Now, four points and I'm done. The first, and this is so important, the Lord is absolutely meticulously sovereign over all things. This is an absolute. There is not anything over which God does not have the final say. Now, that's really important. These people were in dire straits. They were a small, almost defenseless country in comparison to Assyria or Ephraim and Syria. And what God again and again and again will be telling these people I'm in charge. Not just partially. Not just mostly. Not just in big issues. I am absolute detail control of everything. I am in charge always. You have to understand that. Nothing at all comes by accident. Nothing surprises God. In fact, it says in Ephesians, he works all things after the counsel of his will. And, and God through Isaiah is saying to Ahaz, to Judah, to us today, don't you understand? Don't you really comprehend that there is nothing that I do not have charge over? That being the case, who should you trust? The second point and it's a good thing is that not only is God absolutely and meticulously in control of all things, his intentions for his people are only good. Um, sometime read uh, Jeremiah 32 eh, around verses 40 and so because there's this beautiful um, expression. Uh, it's, it follows the, the new covenant and God's going to make a covenant with the people. And the language is this. Um, he's going to make a covenant with the people to do them good. It says in the next verse, he will rejoice to do them good. For his people, God is at work to accomplish his good and blessed work for his people. You know, we, we're very familiar with Romans 8, 28, right? What does it say? God works all things for good. Now, again, what they're to process and what we're to process, we're to see the absolute control of God over Assyria, over Syria, over Pica, over reason, over all these groups and powers. You're supposed to say God's in charge of all that. That's the first thing. At every detail. And secondly, for his people, everything that God is doing is for their good as God defines it. Nothing escapes that. Nothing, nothing uh, uh, misses that. God is always working his good, like in Romans 8, for those who are called, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, right? So you should be, if you're King Ahaz, you know these things, should. Thirdly, his acts of providence may indeed be bitter and harsh, yet they will accomplish the good God has intended for us. There's a book by Piper. It's called Sweet and Bitter Providence. <clears throat> it's about the book of Ruth. Ruth is a wonderful book. The book begins with Ruth and, his, and her sons going into Moab. And what happens there? Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. No. Okay, what happens? Yeah, is it, is it, does it, I mean, they go from a famine to ruin. She, she comes back, I'll get it right now. She comes back, and, and they want to call her Naomi, but she says, don't call me Naomi, call me what? Mar, Mar which means bitterness. I went with stuff, and I came back with nothing. And all I came back with is Ruth, a Moabitess. Now, she loved Ruth, but the problem is, not only did she have to worry about feeding herself, now she had to worry about Ruth. I mean, 
Was she, what, did it look good? That's what you call bitter providences. Here's the children of Israel, and it seems like they're being harassed, and they're being beaten, and they're being threatened by Assyria. And God says, listen, I am in charge. I am doing good for my people, and you must bank on that reality. And fourthly and lastly, we are thus to live in constant reliance on the Lord. Looking back to what God has done. What's really interesting, in this, two severe enemies of the children of Israel are mentioned. Assyria presently, you know what the other one was? is Egypt. Those are two notorious enemies of the children of Israel. You know what's going to happen in, I believe, chapter 19? You know what God's going to do to two enemies in, in a big, glorious sense? He's going to make them there's going to be three of people of God. There's going to be Israel, Assyria, and Egypt. God's going to do some marvelous things in the future. So we look back to what God has done. Has God ever failed? No. God is always in charge. God is always accomplishing his purpose for his people. And so God has been faithful. Then at the same time, we're to look forward to the promises that God make, made. And we must be absolutely assured that God will keep his promises. Can God break his word? Can God lie? Can God say, well, I had my fingers crossed? Now, with that being the case, with what God has done, what God promises, how now are we to live? Clearly, and I get, he's going to say this repeatedly in the chapters to come. How are we to live? We're not to fear. We're not to fear what man can do. In fact, in chapter 8, we looked, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Don't fear, don't worry, don't concern yourself with the, with the events and the powers that, that stir around us because God's in charge of it all. Absolutely in charge of it all. No fear, don't fear him, don't fear them, don't go here, don't go there. Don't fear them, fear God. Secondly, trust God. But you know what? Honestly, is he's the only one, I use this simple term, he's the only one that's trustworthy, isn't he? Isn't the only one trustworthy? You can't trust. Why? No, I mean, you might, have you ever made a promise to someone and really intended to keep that promise, but were prevented from doing it, not because it was outside your control? Have you ever done that? Yeah, you made it, let's say, you, your kids, we're going to go do this, we're going to go there, and all of a sudden you come, you know, you end up sick. Or you say, we're going to go on vacation, and then your car blows up, right? Or some unexpected uh, bill comes along and you can't do it. Is that ever the problem with God? The, the title of this series, Lift Up Your Eyes on High and See, is purposefully designed, the book of Isaiah is for those who are truly God's people to lift your eyes up and to see who God really is. He is to be our fear and he is to be our dread. He says that, but not in a way that would draw us away from him, but in a way in which we'd be drawn to him. And he alone is to be our trust. For God purposes to do us good, and his sovereign hand is in charge of all things. And he says that to Ahaz. He says that to the people, and the vast majority of them blow him off. He's saying the same thing to us today. What honestly occupies your heart and mind? What, what do we think about? What, what, what do we, what are we agitated over? What do we lose sleep over? What, what are we concerned about? Now, like I said, there's, there's two different kinds of fear. There's a, a very blatant fear that paralyzes, but there's a soft fear, a subtle fear, which I think Jesus says, don't be anxious. Most people don't, aren't paralyzed by that kind of fear, but many people are anxious, aren't they? Many people stew over things. Many people try to figure it out, and they go, how in the world, wh what am I going to do? This is just eating me up because they do not see any possible remedy or solution. God says, wait a minute. Don't be anxious. Don't fret. 
For if you are my people, I have your good in mind. I have made a covenant with you to do you good only. My whole heart with whole mind, again in uh, Jeremiah 32, I'm going to do you good. Bank on it. Trust me. Rely on me. Rest on me. For I'm truly trustworthy. Now, it's like the, the, the rule of education. You just keep repeating yourself. And Isaiah is going to do that. You're going to see it again and again and again and again. He's going to keep saying the same thing. But next time, not in two weeks, what you're going to see now is that the, the focus of the confidence and trust in the people will not be a, a wide-angle lens. But what the book of Isaiah does is constantly bring our attention and focus not to God in general, but to this one whom God has promised. And that's Jesus Christ. Now, it's not mentioned Jesus Christ, but you're going to see in chapter 11, the servant of the Lord whom God will equip for his purpose. And our faith rests not in some generic reality, but in the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is our trust, who is our hope, who is our fear, who is our all and all. And if, it, if Christ is ours and we are his, there's no reason to fear anything but God. And we have absolute reason to trust in the sovereign hand of the universe. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for who you are. And Lord, if the truth be known, we're more like Ahaz than we wish to admit. We are burdened, distraught, anxious about so many things that really we have no control over. They can occupy our mind, our thoughts. They can eat away at us. And we don't know what we're going to do. We try to figure it out. But Lord, there is no concern that we should have if we're yours. For you have intended for us, covenanted for us, committed yourself for us to do us good. To bring us to yourself safely. That we might be with you forever. And therefore, Lord, we should just rest and trust in who you are. It's like that song, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the thought of who you are. So, Lord, help our fears to be on you and our trust to be in you. I do pray this in Christ's name. Amen.